I'm Peter Jan. I'm actually CTO of SEO Player. Um, we're, a, we're a company who focus every day on developing just uh, the best video player experience that's out there. Um, any platform, any device. Um, basically, a challenge that a lot of companies have. Um, a challenge that a lot of companies have out there. Um, so today, indeed, we're going to talk about should we build or should we buy our own solution. Um, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, in some cases, it's a lot easier to buy, um, but in some cases, it actually makes a lot of sense to just build your own player. Um, and it actually depends on, on a number of different things. Um, you have to keep in mind the video player, it's, it's like the most viewer-facing component of your video pipeline, and it really defines the viewer experience. So making a good choice in this regard is actually, that's actually very important. Um, how I always see it is there are five key considerations that you have to keep in mind when you're uh, deciding to build or to buy um, a video player. Um, you always have some initial development that you will need to do. Um, there is, of course, once the initial development is done, there's the long-term stuff, uh, stuff like pr product evolution, uh, maintenance and support, um, but also, very, very important, um, the effect that this decision will have on strategic focus. Um, and of course, to wrap it up, I'm going to briefly go over the, the cost of ownership. Because um, if you're owning uh, the video player by buying it, the cost model is going to be completely different uh, compared to actually building one yourself. Um, initial development, that's, that's usually, usually a pretty easy one. Um, usually, most companies, they should start with basing out their requirements. Um, requirements, it's, it's usually pretty clear. Um, people usually know what kind of platforms they want to run on. Um, usually laptops, pretty clear, a bit of mobile. Sometimes there are smart TVs or connected devices um, included in the mix as well. Um, and from there on, you can also pretty clearly state what the environment is that you're going to be running in. Um, you know what kind of hardware that you're running. You know what the infrastructure is. Um, but you also know what kind of stuff you need to integrate. Think about analytics, uh, DRM. Uh, advertisements, that kind of stuff. Um, and because all of those requirements are pretty clear, you also have your full list of features and capabilities that you need to have. Um, and as a result, it's usually pretty easy to get started with this. You can estimate that workload pretty easily. And in some cases, you can actually use open source components, uh, like, for example, the Dash IF reference uh, player. That's usually a component that you can pretty easily leverage um, and build stuff around it. What you will need um, for this step is actually a dedicated team. Uh, it's, it's not something easy to do, so you really need people specialized in video player development. Um, but that's also your biggest cost. So your biggest cost is going to be, for the initial development, it's going to be the team that you need to actually build it. But because you know what the requirements are, you can pretty easily predict um, what that cost is going to be. And of course, after that, it's, it's pretty satisfying to actually see that thing go live and go in production. Um, but that's, that's the first step. Um, after that, you actually get the long-term effects um, that are there. Um, and the first one there is product evolution. Um, and that's actually something that's being forgotten very often. Um, the problem is, within the video space, you guys all know it, um, but things are changing constantly. And it's it's... It's changing at a very rapid pace. Um, one example, um, if you would be here like three years ago, nobody would have been talking about VR. Um, right now, everybody more or less expects that VR is there. Um, it's just a change in feature requirements. Um, it's, it's, it's something you have to keep track of, uh, definitely. And it's not just stuff like features that's there, but it's also on um, performance. If you Remember how it was the first days that YouTube was around. Those startup times, they were massive. That was like 10 seconds startup time before your video would even start playing. But once Google cracked down on that startup time and really started to reduce it, people, people didn't accept that 10 seconds as a startup time anymore. So any other video platform, they need to focus as well on reducing that startup time just, just to remain relevant for their viewers. Um, and it's a whole bunch of stuff like, like those, uh, those performance increases um, that are needed as well. Um, it's a startup time, but it's also stuff like, for example, 4K, um, 
HDR is coming up as well. Um, it's, it's that kind of evolutions within the market that you really need to keep track of. Um, and the problem is if you don't keep track of this kind of changes, you'll become obsolete pretty fast. Um, users won't be satisfied anymore um, and they'll just leave, basically. Um, besides those things, performance and, and feature-wise, capability-wise, there's also another part of product evolution that's pretty important, and it's basically the platform evolutions that are there. Um, I think it's about seven years ago by now that actually the iPad launched. Um, I don't think that anyone can remove the iPad from, uh, from the viewer experience equation at this point anymore. Um, but it's not just stuff like the iPad. It's, it's also stuff like, for example, Chromecasts or, or Fire TVs, um, devices that are a lot more recent. Um, as well as software that's coming out, new browsers like Edge or Vivaldi. Um, you need to keep track of those, because once someone starts to, to provide their content on those, other people will expect other content to be available there as well. So basically, what you need to do for this product evolution step, you really need to keep track and actually keep up with companies like Google, like Netflix, um, to make sure that you don't lag behind uh, for the viewer experience part. Um, biggest problem with product evolution is actually that it's a big unknown. Um, nobody can predict the future, or at least not predict it very accurately. Um, so you won't know what kind of resources th this will require from you. Um, it's very difficult to actually estimate what it will be, but you really need that roadmap, and you really need to make sure that your uh, player will evolve, because otherwise it will, just, um, it will just lag behind and become obsolete. Um, very often forgotten when making the build or buy decision, actually, this product evolution part. Um, another long-term part, the maintenance and support. It's something that most people do uh, remember. Um, maintenance and support, it's, it's funny. Um, most engineers I know, when you tell them we're going to build something new, they get very excited. But then the maintenance comes up and the support comes up. They usually don't want to do it. Usually, that kind of teams, it's different teams that, that people need. Um, but you really need a dedicated team for, for maintenance and support. Um, and it's not just fixing bugs. Um, it's actually also keeping up with the evolutions that are in the landscape. Um, for example, just maintaining browser versions. Um, Chrome comes out with a new update of its browser every six weeks. Um, so that's a quite rapid pace. Um, but the same can be said, for example, for Firefox. Um, even browsers like Edge have, have pretty rapid update schemes. Um, and the same can be set for Safari, for example. Um, so your QA team really needs to take this kind of things into account, maintain the player every time, again and again. Um, and it's not just browsers, for example, but it can also be like your DRM integrations, your CDN, your analytics provider. All of those things, they can make changes, and you really need to keep track of those. So you really need a team that's on top of this kind of things. Um, sometimes, again, costs can be known because for maintenance and support, there are models um, to actually map this out. But a big chunk of it, it's basically you're dependent on, on other parties. Um, so if they do some big updates, you'll need to make sure that your team can follow on that as well. Um, and that team, that basically brings me to strategic focus. Um, for a lot of a lot of times, it's basically the question, what is the core aspect of your business? And, and the question is, is your video player really, really this, this core aspect? Does it, does it bring you a strategic advantage? And very often, player development, what we see at least, is that player development gets combined with some front-end work, some back-end work. Um, it's the same engineering team. But then the question is, would you want your engineers to be focused on um, bringing new viewer experience and improving uh, the things that matter for your business, or would you want them to, build, to waste months on building a video player? Um, and you will have to take into account that you'll be investing more and more time, of course, uh, for the maintenance and the support uh, for all the new changes that you, that you have to make. Um, so the question really is, for the strategic focus part, um, what's bringing you revenue? Is it the player that's bringing you revenue, or is it something else? Because, of course, where the revenue is, that's, that's where the focus would be. Um, that's the only thing that makes sense. 
and all of that thing, of course, the revenue, that's, that's a direct link um, to the total cost of ownership. What you really need is you re need to know what will it cost, whatever the decision you make. Um, it's, always, it's always an important consideration. Um, actually, it's, it's pretty clear what it will cost um, to actually run a player in some cases. Um, the question is, what's the cost of the integration, of course? What's the cost of maintaining it? What's the cost of running it? And if you look at buying, then it's usually pretty clear. Um, you have a contract in place. You know more or less what the integration will cost you. Um, the contract will define what the usage cost will be. Um, there will be something in that contract as well about maintenance. Um, so that's always pretty, pretty clear. Um, another advantage is, of course, a player that you buy. It basically means that they have a roadmap. They will follow all of those evolutions that the landscape is doing. Um, they have the SLAs, so they will do the maintenance and support. Um, so that actually comes down to the total costs. It's basically defined in the contract. If you go to building, um, that's not really the case. Um, as I mentioned before, the initial cost for the initial development, because the requirements are known, that cost is usually pretty much known as well. Um, there could be delays, but in general, you can estimate that pretty accurately. The question is, what will happen if those requirements change? What happens to those product evolutions? Um, what happens um, for the maintenance and support? And that's most of the time a lot more unclear. Um, that's not something that you can predict uh, very much in advance, but it is really required to actually know um, and to estimate those kind of things uh, before making your decision. Um, big cost will be, of course, the dedicated team that you need um, to update everything and to maintain everything. Um, but there, the, the cost is usually pretty unknown. Um, and of course, another big question is, what will happen uh, in case that the technology that you based your, your player on becomes obsolete, like happened with Flash or with Silverlight? Um, I wouldn't want to be the guy that needs to, needed to go to, to his boss at that time, uh, saying that, yeah, we've done a pretty big investment now. We've built a Flash player for five years. Um, but now we need to switch to something else, and we need to throw away that investment. Um, so in short, there's no real right or wrong answer. Um, in some cases, it's a lot better to build, actually. Um, I mean, if, if your strategic focus uh, means that your player is very, very important, um, or, for example, when you know that your return on investment is going to be so big, that the cost perspective, and, and especially the unknown part about the cost, is not really an issue. Um, and I mean, in that case, you probably have expertise in-house, so you have a team that, that's capable of, of doing this kind of things. Then yes, it could make absolute sense to, to build your player. Um, but in case that you need to make sure in advance what the cost is, um, if it's not really your focus, then it's actually better to actually buy a player. I mean, you'll get a team of experts building that player, doing nothing else but that. Um, but it's remote. It's not shifting away the attention of your team. Um, the same can be said about the SLAs and the maintenance and supports. It's, it's all stuff that you don't need to, uh, need to have on top of your mind anymore because someone is taking care of it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically the, the biggest decision. Um, the most important part here is that when you make this decision, do it before you actually start implementing anything. Um, what we've seen in the past is a lot of companies make a decision, but you don't want to throw away a big investment that you made. Um, you really want to think about it uh, before you just start, uh, before you start doing this kind of things. And uh, that's more or less it. And it looks like I sticked within time pretty good. Um, so. Any questions? We have several uh, minutes for questions. Must have a question. Build versus buy. Everybody needs to know. No? OK. Yeah. We have oh, we a have question one? over there. Oh. Very good. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, do you, how do you look at that? Um, how do you see customers make that? the judgment calls in terms of the app development side of players? 
like you know, with uh, native SDKs for Android or iOS versus web player? Um, native SDKs versus web, it's, it's interesting, uh, but it depends on your use case. Um, we see a lot of people who are actually doing the mobile web part as well. Um, it's something that's been forgotten quite often. Um, people tended to build apps first and then go to web later. Um, but we see it more and more because a lot of players are actually based on HTML5, you can get best of both worlds. So you can get native SDKs with apps um, integrated there, but you can also have the web apps. Um, actually, something that we focus on is making sure that it runs on any platform. So making sure that it runs in the web apps, but also making sure that it works in exactly the same way within the SDKs. Um, so what's important there is you want similar APIs. You want to, what we've seen, and it's actually pretty, pretty related as well, is what we've seen is companies using tens of, of different uh, player vendors. And imagine what happens when you need to change like the color of a button. Um, if you have 10 different vendors, 10 different players, you need to re-implement that change of that color of that button for 10. You need to do that 10 times. There's, there's no other way. Um, but if you have one uniform API and one uniform uh, core in there, then you can actually make that change once and push it across all the different platforms. Um, so native SDKs versus HTML5, it's, it's not really, it, it really depends on, on the use case, but there are ways to actually have best of both worlds. Um, okay, anyone else? I don't see anyone, okay. Yeah, well, there's another We do have another there. one. Okay, how do you factor in third party plugin integrations with build versus buy? Yeah. Um, if you're building it yourself, then it's usually pretty clear what kind of uh, parties that you need to integrate with. Because you know the analytics that you're using, you know the DRM that you're using, you know the ads that you're using. So in that case, you'll probably just integrate with those and just hope that your business unit won't decide to switch integrations every so often. Um, if you pick a player that you're gonna buy, then it's of course very important of how you can actually integrate those. Um, for some partnerships within the industry, you do have, um, for example, analytics companies working with players, um, providing an, an additional library that you can add. Um, the biggest risk that I see in that, that regard is um, you need someone to maintain that as well. So if you're doing your own integration or trusting on some third party integration, in my experience that usually doesn't really pan out. Um, for us, our approach there again, it's, it's we really prefer to take control of those integrations. Um, we actually don't prefer it when customers do integrations. We prefer to do it in house. We set up a partnership with those other components um, and make sure that we can QA the hell out of those components. Um, so if they do an update, that we know that it still works. If we do an update, that we know that it still works. Um, so it's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind that if you're deciding on a player, if you ever want to change, um, for example, an analytics, com an analytics party that you're working with or a DRM uh, party that you're working with, that you know that that player will ensure that it's compatible as well. Um, it's usually a, a more difficult decision, um, but it's defi definitely possible. Um, it's just something you need to check in advance. Okay, big hand, everybody, for Peter Jan.